Hi everyone, it's Raina. So this video is a brief analysis of the natal chart of Edie Sedgwick. And I don't know about any of you, but I'm one of those people that maybe I see something on YouTube. Uh, it's recommended to me because of uh, what I've watched before. And then I become completely obsessed and actually... Um, the other night, that's what happened, <laughs> and I went on uh, an Edie <laughs> Sedgwick binge-watching episode, and um, I actually read the book by, I guess it's Gene Stein, George Plimpton, uh, it was like a, I, I don't know if you'd call it an oral history type of book where a lot of, you know, different people that knew Edie contributed to it. I kind of like those uh, biographies because you get different points of view. And there have, you know, there there was a movie uh, about Edie called Factory Girl. Gosh, I can't think of uh, the actress that played her. Um, but I'm sure a lot of you know who I'm talking about. And I mean, I read the book like many years ago, and they finally made a movie about Edie. Edie uh, was, what would you call her? She was um, a fixture uh, in the, you know, uh, hip scenes, uh, Andy Warhol, mid-60s. But it was a very brief period that she was part of his factory scene, and she was already a troubled young woman, and she uh, disintegrated, you know, mentally, and ended up dying um, of a drug overdose in 1971 at the age of 28. And um, so I, I wanted to kind of like um, look at some of the information here about her through the natal chart, because I was very curious, and I was so glad that they had a time of birth for her because, um, you know, that's how you garner the most information. So she was born on April 20th, 1943 in Santa Barbara, California. And um, that's on the cusp of uh, Taurus. She was 29 degrees of Aries, and 29 is a critical degree of a sign. And it's con it's considered this, um, I would say, like a point of wisdom in terms of whatever that sign represents. Well, we're talking about Aries, and Aries is like this um, fireball, very energetic. It's a cardinal sign. It's very willful. Uh, Mars can be the will, but I mean, when I say willful, I'm not even talking about being stubborn like Taurus, although I think Edie was because she was on the cusp of Taurus, but um, the average Aries person is going to be very um, interested in doing their own thing their own way. And, uh, you know, Mars is about, you know, one's drive. And, and how one does things. And also anger is Mars, the sex drive is Mars, and that kind of thing. And um, and so people who are Aries tend to be very rebellious. And, you can, you know, <laughs> I was going to say, you can't tell an Aries person what to do um, because they will just, um, they will balk at that. And a lot of Aries people, you know, anger is the first thing you think of because they tend to um, be, you know, Mars is the god of war, so they always tend to be at war with life in one way or the other. Now, I mean, if, if somebody has a positive expression of Aries overall, if their sun is well aspected, they will tend to be more energetic than combative. But like I said, Edie was born on the cusp of Taurus. When people are born on a cusp, they can feel like they're in two worlds. And that can, you know, have different um, effects, you know. I think a lot of times there can be almost identity confusion. 
and I'm talking about um, who to become because the sun is, you know, something that we grow into, I feel, and really ultimately uh, reflects our destiny that we are kind of um, directing for ourselves, you know, what we want for ourselves, what we aspire to become. And depending on how willing a person is to, um, let's say, embody their son, that I think will indicate their measure of success in the world. Success is kind of a um, difficult thing to fully measure by one um, criterion, because there are plenty of people who are successful in their field, their, their career of choice, and they are completely miserable in their private life. And, and they may be super duper talented. So, um, I think with Edie that she was like a force of nature. I might've even, uh, kind of remembered that from reading, uh, uh, that book that biography of hers a number of times somebody might have called her that and she was she was kind of like a muse I would say Bob Dylan wrote a couple of songs that alluded to her one of them was like a rolling stone and the other was just um just like a woman and um both of those songs you know hinted at the fragility that she possessed. But, you know, there's going to be with Aries always that defiance and that, um, I think, you know, in terms of energetically, they just kind of really light up a room, uh, Aries people. And looking at her information here, you know, she had Gemini rising which can be somebody who is uh, a chameleon. And I always look to the rising sign to see the family of origin and perhaps how the person had to cope with fitting into that family. And, and she came from a very troubled family, um, you know, with abuse and all kinds of stuff, um, mental illness. And uh, even though they were really wealthy. I mean, the family itself had ups and downs with money, but they, they were uh, part of the elite, um, their uh, pedigree, if you will. And so the, the point being that, um, a Gemini is mutable air sign. And so when you have that as a rising sign, it can protect you because it can give you detachment. And so if you're dealing with a lot of emotional chaos around you, um, having that type of a flexible demeanor can help you to, to survive, you know, even, um, and also that, you know, if, if there's a lot of volatility in your household growing up, and you see like a lot of different things happening. Um, and some of them may be quite confusing when you're young. You can just become whatever you need to be um, for your own sake. And when you grow up, I mean, I mean, like I said, to function in the family, but it, it's something that when you get older, you may continue to do. It's almost like... Um, somebody who puts on various masks and the rising sign can be considered a mask in and of itself, but this could be many masks. And, um, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, people who have Gemini rising are often seen by others as changing in their appearance, um, uh, from time to time, not just what they're doing, but how they're just being perceived. I mean, I'm not talking about if you're actually dyeing your hair or something like that. And, you know, uh, speaking of dyeing one's hair, if you 
look at different pictures of Edie, there are pictures of her with dark hair. She actually, I think that was her natural hair color, was being a brunette. But there are so many pictures of her with even like silver or white hair that um, was kind of that uh, frosted hair that she, you know, made so glamorous when she was associated with um, Andy Warhol that um, that she really did have different uh, appearances and and but again I'm I'm talking about even beyond that um, some people they can just seem the way that they're acting. It's like they have multiple personalities or something. And um, and also, I think, too, that can give like a very thin type of a, um, a frame, like a, a, a small frame. And so whether, you know, I'm not talking about height, but whether the person tends to be quite um, thin rather than uh, bigger boned or something like that and like a waif and and I think that that was another thing that she was called she did have an eating disorder so of course that also contributed to um that image or you know that appearance but but um I think she probably would have been thin no matter what so um the other thing I see here is that she had the moon in Scorpio. So we can say that somebody with the moon in Scorpio um, is going to have a very em uh, intensely emotional type of, um, I mean, I, I wanted to say personality, but it's really, you know, I, I've, I've read that the, the moon is a personality. I, I don't like that because I think that it's a combination. I think the sun contributes a lot to the personality and even the rising sign. But um, the moon definitely gives that emotional expression. And in this case, it's going to be very, it's going to be at a deep level. And it's very interesting because, um, like I said, I read that biography of hers many years ago and... So I had in my own mind this image of how she was, how she might have talked, how she, you know, all these things. I, I saw pictures of her, but I didn't see all the pictures of her or more pictures of her. And, you know, that was a mind blower to see pictures that were not in the book, uh, you know, later on. And um, also when I heard her voice for the first time and that wasn't that long ago when I saw that she was on YouTube. It blew me away because she had such a ritzy sorts of sort of voice, you know, in that classic uh, style. And but it was just the tenor of it. I just never expected her. You know, I actually thought she would have a very high pitched voice just by looking at her and seeing what a waif that she looked like. Um, I thought that she would have that type of a, a voice and she didn't. It was almost very kind of, I don't know if husky is an appropriate uh, adjective, but something that was deeper than, than what I thought. And here we're talking about emotions and deep emotions. And she said some things um, in one of the movies. Now, um, that's the other thing too, is that she did make movies with Andy Warhol and um, some of them are just like short arty artsy types of movies but then there was a longer project called Chow Manhattan that some of you may know about and that movie was pieced together because they started it like I think they started in 1966 when she was still with Warhol and then she broke with him that year but they still were doing the project and they ended up um, finishing it um, towards the end of her life and um, by then she was quite wasted and it's really um, hard to watch those last sequences but even the earlier ones you can tell that um, that it was getting bad 
you know, in terms of her drug use, slurring her words and things like that. But, you know, with the dialogue, I'm not sure if, um, how much of it was written for her and how, you know, how much of it was her just speaking on her life. Because, um, I do feel that if she was saying a lot of those things herself, that she had a very, a lot deeper personality than people may have realized because of her image as this society girl, rather than somebody who, um, may have, uh, and, and somebody who was just like always, you know, intoxicated. And, um, she, she, I, I really feel like she had, um, possibly, you know, that she had psychic abilities and things like that, that she really had a spiritual side to her, but that she had been so abused from such an early age that it was very hard for her, um, just because of the drugs to break free from that. I mean, she was drugged, uh, when she was a young girl and, um, when she, when she found, when she, uh, walked in on her father, um, having sex with another woman and she tried to, I think, tell her mother or something like that. And they drugged her and said she was crazy. So these kinds of things, I think her father was like an incredible narcissist. I mean, to say the least, um, she lost two brothers, one to suicide and the other one, you know, in a, oh, that's really weird because I just found out that, today that, um, he, the other brother died on, uh, January 12th. Um, I can't remember what year, but she lost two of her three brothers. And, um, and it's said they, they blame the father, um, for, for that because of his treatment towards, uh, his sons. And, um, so in the chart, you can see this because she has Chiron there and that can be a trauma. And, um, you know, it's funny, she has the North node in conjunction with Chiron in the third house. And to me, it's almost as if that set the template, that was the template for her, um, unraveling that she because of her brother's death that she felt in some way, I don't know if it was responsible or, you know, like survivor's guilt, if it was something like that. Um, and maybe, you know, that just enhanced her, her tendency towards self-destruction. But the other thing too, with the third house, it's about, um, your voice and, when Chiron is in the third house, the person may feel like they don't have a voice, like their, their truth or their voice is, um, suppressed is, you know, not, uh, listened to what have you. And, um, so that may have been something that eventually, you know, cause the North node is tied into it, that she, was to become the voice of her generation in some way. You know, um, they called it you, her youth Quaker, you know, and this was 1965. This is the year I was born. So that year really stands out to me. And this was the year that she was this it girl. And I believe she was featured in life magazine. Um, and, you know, it's funny. Another thing that is so funny is that um, for some reason, I wasn't looking for it, but they, I, when I was looking for information on her today, they were talking about her height and they said she was 5'5". Five, five. And I had just seen a video of her and she had really long legs and she looks much taller than 5'5". Five, five, so I don't know if that's a mistake or not. But if it's not a mistake, I mean, it just goes to show that energetically, you can appear larger than life, you know, uh, you know, if you have this amaz am amazing energy. And speaking about that, speaking of larger than life, she has Jupiter 
or she had Jupiter in the first house of uh, the self. Jupiter in the first house, in terms of like coming into this lifetime, can mean somebody who's born into wealth. Um, she grew up on a ranch uh, in California and in, it, you know, sprawling land, but very isolated apparently. Didn't go to school with other children. They were uh, taught on the property. And so that was very isolating. This is something that narcissists do to keep the children. She was one of, she was the seventh of eighth, eight children. And uh, it keeps them under the control of the narcissist that much more. So the brainwashing really sinks in and they don't get any other influences. But, um, but still, she was born into this wealthy situation, although um, there were times when the finances fluctuated, and then I guess they moved to a different ranch where they found oil, or one of the ranches they found oil, and that was how they were able to, um, again, be prosperous. But they did, you know, I think both her mother and her father came from distinguished backgrounds, um, you know, going back to, I think, the founding fathers. So in any case, um, so Jupiter in the first sometimes can be about being born fortunate. And this is a prime example of the current penchant for using the word privileged and talking about people who are born into wealth, who are born uh, with a so-called high status in life. And it's, it's something that really irritates me because there is a lot of um, madness with people who are wealthy. There's a lot of, you know, um, dysfunctional behavior and mental illness and that sort of thing. Being born wealthy means that you may be able to afford things and you're able to uh, not have to worry about money, but it doesn't mean that you are immune from suffering, not by a long shot. And um, if you're born to humble beginnings and you have parents who love you and who are you know, stable mentally and who, you know, who are uh, responsible people, you will probably do much better in life than somebody who's born into a wealthy background and doesn't have, uh, who is neglected by their parents for whatever reason and um, that sort of thing. So um, the fact that she has Jupiter in the, f in the first house, if we didn't know what ended up happening to her, we might think, oh, she's lucky. Another interesting thing is that Edie has um, Pluto in the second house of earned income, but we can just kind of talk about it in terms of uh, her money situation. Um, she was being given money each month. I think it was a trust fund something along those lines, I can't remember. And then she did something, I don't know if she like went through it all, like she was supposed to get, and then kept getting advances, and then she went through it all. I can't remember, but at one point, her family stopped subsidizing her. And so she was kind of left to her own devices. And that likewise led to her um, deterioration, although who knows if that really was the number one culprit. Um, she, you know, Pluto in the second house can actually mean a lot of shame around money, dirty money. Now, that's an interesting thing when we talk about dirty money because Pluto rules the underworld. And sometimes, and they say, you know, there's a, a saying that the greatest fortunes come from the greatest crimes or something like that. And, you know, I don't know if that's true. I mean, certainly I've been, you know, lately there have been uh, indications that some people, you know, they're the billionaires, how they have gotten money um, is, you know, we just hear that a person is a billionaire, but we don't know like how it all came about. Um, and Pluto is about control too. So it can be that the person feels controlled by 
money. Like money is used as a weapon to control the person. And this is so true. This is another reason why I always say not to get caught up in um, class warfare, you know, because when you, when you think that um, people who are so-called privileged, that they always um, just live, uh, you know, this high and mighty life, um, it can be actually very uh, traumatizing because they're expected to do certain things and jump through, through certain hoops in order to keep getting that money, that money becomes like really a leash. And because, you know, especially if you're raised with a lot of privilege, and I'm talking about, let's say you have uh, maids and nannies and all this stuff in beautiful, luxurious surroundings, and all of a sudden you become 18 and it's about to get cut off. You, you know, do you really want to go and have to fend for yourself. And and a lot of times, these people, the parents, the family, they deliberately keep the child helpless so that they feel like they, they don't have anything to offer society and that they have no um, skills. And they might not have certain skills, but they may have other ones. For instance, Edie was, a, um, was artistic. And people who are artistic a lot of times suffer because it's hard to fit into, um, you know, mainstream society. You're already naturally probably more sensitive than the average person, and yet you're expected to be competitive. You're expected to go out, and, and are you going to be able to make a living from your talent? A lot of times people don't know how to do that or they try and they fail. And it's so um, discouraging that it can lead to not wanting to try again. So her Pluto in the second house may have been, it might have felt that money was destructive, that it was destroying her, but she, but there might be an obsession about it because, you know, it was given and then taken away. So there's almost like this conditional quality, the psychological warfare. One of the big things that stands out to me is Edie's fourth house of home and family. She has Neptune here, which is a classic case. You know, the, the fourth house can be the mother. It's going to be your family, your childhood in general. But in terms of the mother, the mother apparently was bipolar and I believe I haven't read her I haven't read the biography in many years but I think the mother may have been on pills herself so she may have had an addiction and Neptune rules addiction so this can be an addicted household and what goes along with addicted households is our lies um, the shame that it causes creates uh, a need for the parents to deny that they're who they how they're acting so they make up they they make up these these uh, false narratives to try to explain away the bizarre behavior that's occurring the other thing too is that the memories can be quite hazy um, of course, she was drugged herself as a child, so there you go. And also, skeletons in the closet. That's this house. And uh, there was talk of sexual abuse. And that is so. That is something that can be so sh um, inducing of shame that you know, especially if it's incest, if it's, you know, that kind of thing within the family, that it can cause the person to just zone out and repress those memories of what is happening. Definitely confusion in the household. Um, you know, uh, speaking of the sexual abuse, you know, again, the, the tapes from Chow Manhattan 
suggest that she was saying that she was abused. And then I was reading something else that said that, you know, she said that her father and brothers were always trying to have sex with her. I think that she, I think that, um, she was sexually abused. Definitely. Um, I think that's the anorexia, um, you know, that feeling of being out of control. It's, you know, there's no way that I, I just don't think that, um, they were trying. She might've fought it off, but, um, I do think that, uh, there was a lot of, you know, re real, um, sick behavior in that family. And, uh, you know, of course it's just my opinion, but I think she's, you know, said it in the, in the, uh, in Chow Manhattan and that it contradicted other things. So, um, I'm just going by what, what I think she said. So, um, uh, one thing that was, Oh yeah, you know, it was really um sad cuz one thing that she did say was that her father beat her one time and he just really you know, hurt her. And she um she said she was crying for like I, I don't know if she said like 12 days straight or something like that and I mean, it was like a long period of time and she said nobody ever asked if she was okay or anything like that. Then finally they took her to the uh, doctor or something and I think that he prescribed drugs. But, you know, can you imagine having those emotions and your own parents not even caring enough or being sane enough to know that... Um, that the child was incredibly traumatized and then when she finally was seen what was done they drugged her up to shut her up and you know that's just really um sad and um so in the fifth house she has the moon and this is again you know the fifth house can be like love. So people with the moon in the fifth house can really be longing for somebody to love them and to love somebody, you know, so there can be that romantic, um, um, you know, kind of, uh, an influence, but it's more, you know, it's more emotional, like not just like loving the idea of love, but really needing it almost to feel, um, whole maybe emotionally but also artistically this is the house of creativity so the moon here can indicate you know wanting that kind of um or you know needing to to have a creative release in order to feel emotionally balanced so anyone who has the moon in the fifth house should really honor their creativity even if it's something that um is not quite, um, you know, front and center in their life. It might be important. I'm going to, um, not talk about the, about Mars in the ninth house. I don't think that that's particularly important for this, but in terms of the 11th house, I think that in terms of her ability to gain fame, um, the sun is here and so is Mercury. Now they are in different signs, although, you know, <laughs> the sun is almost in Taurus too. Now, one thing to say about Taurus is that it is ruled by Venus. So people who have, um, a prominent, um, uh, Taurus, usually they will say, or Libra, you know, which is also ruled by Venus. They can be physically attractive. And of course, you know, Edie wouldn't have been Edie if she didn't look the way that she looked. And she was actually, you know, she was a, an incredibly beautiful woman. But she had like a boyish um, body. She wasn't like, uh, you know, kind of like this voluptuous uh, type of woman. So her appeal, you know, she had a beautiful face. And not to say that her body wasn't beautiful, but the thing was that there is more to, to it than just 
uh, you know, even sex appeal can have different um, facets to it. You know, even energetically, somebody can be considered very attractive because they they draw people in and it's charisma and you can't really put your finger on it. Um, but she was very stylish and she created some of her th looks, you know, and I don't know exactly, I'm assuming that she was influential fashion wise in the mid mid sixties. I don't know to what extent. Um, but again, the eleventh house is the collective, is the mass the masses. I mean we, we even now talk about um the internet can be connected to the eleventh house. Well back then that version of it, um the third house is the media and uh I don't know if the eleventh house would be mass media, but it's television and uh the way that we um that a person can communicate to the masses because you know this is Aquarius's house so it's going to um be something that is appealing to many people and she also has mercury here so the you know it's not so much the things that she said but the, you know, sometimes you can, you can make statements, fashion statements, but it's, but it's almost like you're saying something, um, that you're speaking for your generation. Mercury, um, forms a square with Chiron, um, and so it is afflicted. I mean, it's it, her Mercury, I wouldn't call it afflicted just because of that, but, um, because of the Chiron square, um, and because Mercury in the 11th is so social, um, that may have been that betrayal that she felt. She got, she was betrayed by certain people, you know, um, the two that are mentioned the most are, uh, Andy Warhol and Bob Dylan, but, um, you know, it's really hard to, to blame people, even, even when you can make a case, I think, especially with Bob Dylan, I, I don't think that he exploited her. Um, I think that she may have misunderstood his intentions, but, uh, you know, with Andy Warhol, there may be something more there because he actually used her in movies, but, um, she came into that scene already a broken young woman. She, it wasn't that he broke her, but, um, he may have exacerbated everything, but that you can't blame a person, um, for somebody else's vulnerability, but you can look to whether or not they, uh, took advantage, um, when they shouldn't have. And, uh, so that could certainly be the case, but, um, in, you know, speaking of being a victim and being taken advantage of, in her 12th house, she has three planets. Um, she has Venus, she has Uranus, and she has Saturn. Saturn is the Lord of Karma. In the 12th house, this can be somebody who does feel that they are getting that uh, karmic, uh, you know... Um, payback or something where they feel like thwarted in life. And I don't think that she had found herself at the time of her passing. Um, so she, it's, you know, it was very, it was very, um, touching because right before she died, a palm reader looked at her hand and she kind of like was shocked because she had a very short lifeline. And as soon as she, I guess she you know, showed some kind of reaction. And Edie goes, I know, I know, you know, like she knew that she was destined only to live a certain amount of time. And that's the kind of thing that fatalism that we, we might see with somebody with Saturn in the 12th house, where they always feel like they are doomed, or they feel like they are thwarted, that they can't do what they want to do. Saturn is obstacles, so if anybody out there has Saturn in the 12th house, it's important to 
you know, really make a point of feeding yourself positivity, surrounding yourself with positive, positive people, positive ideas, and, you know, and not succumbing to this notion that, um, you're not meant to have certain things because of, um, having Saturn in the 12th house, actually Saturn can give everyone what they want. It might be delayed. So in the 12th house, you know, your good karma, I, I mean, I don't like to focus too much on karma because I think karma is really about, um, what you choose to still be affected by because of your own issues. And I think you can just destroy karma with insight. Um, but, you know, in terms of like your past actions, um, it might turn into something really great because it's almost like sometimes I feel like Saturn is, is testing the person. How much, you know, how many, you know, how much balls do you have? Um, and then Uranus is here. Uranus can be somebody who, well, first of all, that can give psychic ability for sure from the 12th house. Um, but, um, in addition to that, that can even be, since the 12th house can be, um, you know, karmic, it could be that, you know, since her son is in the 11th house, this idea of, um, being famous or reaching the masses has a karmic connection. Um, whatever that would have been, I don't know what the meaning of her, you know, being famous to whatever degree you want to say she's famous. And actually, you know, even after her death, you know, that's when she has really, you know, there's people that are really like into her, they're like defending her online, uh, against other people, you know, people always love to root for the underdogs like Brian, Jones and, uh, the people who are misunderstood and, and, uh, you know, oh, that was an interesting thing too, because Nick Drake, um, who was a British, uh, singer, songwriter, and, um, who was not, I don't think, I think it's fair to say that he was not famous when he was alive. He died in the, I think mid seventies of a drug or, you know, of an antidepressant overdose and he had his own psychological issues um but he was somebody who wrote a song I don't know if it was called fruit tree but there was a song about you know him you know about somebody who became famous after they died and he had moon in Scorpio so the theme of death is certainly going to be true of somebody who has, it's like death becomes a theme in their life in one way or the other. I mean, sometimes it can be just like Edie with her brothers dying and that being very um, traumatic for her. But um, the same thing I would say about Nick Drake is with Edie is that they both became famous later. And, uh, I mean, of course, Edie did have her fame in, in the sixties, but I think that it was, I don't, I, I really don't know how to measure it in the overall perspective, if it was more of a cult thing or if it had broader appeal, I have a feeling it was more on the cult side because she was, you know, with, uh, Andy Warhol and in those days, you know, because they, now that we have the internet and we have all these other ways of finding out about what was going on. Um, I think these things have become popularized in recent years. Uh, Nick Drake, you know, had a, had a commercial that they used his song Pink Moon and that really put him on the map, so to speak. So, and I think that was around 2000, I'm not sure, but, um, so what else did I want to say? So in 12th house, Uranus here, can mean hiding your, uh, different, the way, you know, like, um, being more of a conformist than you should be, uh, because Uranus rules Aquarius and it's supposed to be the oddball, the, 
the uh, contrarian and the um, uh, iconoclast, what can I say, like um, just somebody who is going against the grain, the nonconformist, that was what I was looking for. And actually, um, it's very interesting because I'm thinking to myself, I'm saying, how could I possibly think that Edie was a conformist? But, you know, in a lot of ways, she was playing the role of the socialite. And maybe if she had broken free from her family uh, fully, psychologically, not just um, geographically, but if she had really, like, um, let go of the need to be associated with the upper crust, if you will, in society, and um, and that sort of thing, maybe she could have um, ended up living a normal life. She she actually got married right before she died, and that was also very tragic because it looked like she was happy that she was settling into a quieter life. And so, um, yeah, so there's that, and then Venus is here. And it seemed to me that, that she really had a, there was a lot of um, affairs, but not really, and I think she even mentioned this, not really a lot of um, deep relationships and her Venus was in Gemini and um, interestingly her Mars was in Pisces and Mars is your drive in Pisces it can be the person who is driven to self-destruction but not always Bob Dylan has Mars in Pisces so you know although uh, Vincent van Gogh I believe had that and um, it can indicate um, somebody who is driven to substance abuse but not always it can be a great placement for an artist who is very very driven to create and you know Pisces is this imagine imagination the soul of a poet you know a soul of the artist and so that can certainly be um it depends on the individual, but it's very interesting. So her Venus and Mars were squared. And uh, therefore, you know, she may have noticed that the male-female relationship was, um, you know, looking at her parents was, she might have concluded that it just wasn't right. Her Even her sun and moon are opposing one another, and the sun can be the father and moon the mother. And... Um, and so that can indicate somebody that doesn't have a good view of relationships, of, you know, of um, significant others, that that kind of relationship may be seen as something that is very um, problematic and fraught with peril even. Okay, well, I, you know, one last thing I wanted to say, her midheaven is in Pisces, and um, Pisces, now, as I recall, Neptune, the ruler of Pisces, is connected to um, photography, and I think a lot of her appeal was through image, because, you know, she really didn't have a lot of... Um, a vehicle for actually communicating in other ways. She was, you can go on YouTube and they have clips of, of her on Merv Griffin, which is really a mind blower in 1965. That was kind of the height of her fame and, you know, in the mainstream society at least. Um, but um, I think it was mostly through image, through her looks, through, but not just her, how she was, you know, her, her, her natural looks, but, the the glamour that she created through her fashion sense, the peacock earrings, the short hairstyle, the kind of the white frosted hair, all of those things that were very glam, very, um, you know, during that mid-60s period, mod, um, I, I don't know what the, the term would be in America for that. Um, the pop art culture, you know, experimental. You know, it was perfect for that scene. And um, 
yeah, so I, I hope that you enjoyed this. And um, my website is rainamoonastrology.com. There's a link below to my reading options. If you're interested in a natal chart interpretation, take care. Bye.